because uh, the purpose of you doing a certain analysis is you have an unknown sample and you want to do some analysis to find out the concentration okay if it's a quantitative analysis so if it's a quantitative analysis you need to use one of these techniques I can ask you you know okay if I were to use the first technique calibration curve using external external standards you go into the lab what are you gonna do you have to tell me what solutions you have to prepare what readings you have to take what plots you have to do for each and every one you should be able to do that now for you to be able to answer how answer the question of how you are going to how you're gonna do it what solutions you're going to prepare you need to understand each and every one plus also you need to understand each of these calibration techniques in order to solve any problem given to you a problem given to you is already stated okay this solution is prepared you add this you do this you plot this what is the concentration in the unknown when given such a problem you have to look at the problem and figure out which one it is so that you know how to calculate it because the the way it's being the way you set up your calculations for each of these calibration techniques will be different so back to the original thing you must understand each and every one if not i ask you what you what you have to do in the lab you don't know given a certain problem you you don't know which one which one to choose which one it is you must identify which calibration technique is used only then do you know how to work with the data because the problem can just give you a data give you a set of data for you to work with okay so first one simplest using a calibration curve you go to the lab I, you have an unknown sample what must you prepare in order to find out what the concentration of that unknown is using the first one prepare a series of cali uh, standards of known concentration then what's next so let's say we want to do copper you prepare a series of copper standards then get the response for ab absorbance or emission for what for what what solutions each of those standard solutions which you have prepared okay let's say you have four or five solutions so for each one you go to the instrument and get the absorbance or emission if you do absorption spectroscopy you must get absorbance readings if you do emission you get emission intensity next plot which curve what curve do you plot what versus what absorbance if it's measuring absorbance versus concentration absorbance versus concentration so you plot how, let's say just now he prepared four standards so how many points will you have on that plot four he prepared four standards okay like you have four like, and the blank maybe one more so you have four points okay so you have absorbance versus concentration four points including the zero maybe zero zero next i have my unknown solution unknown concentration okay solution with an unknown concentration and just now we, was, we said we did copper you want to know copper what do i do with that unknown solution after getting the readings for those standard solutions what do i do what do i do with an, my unknown solution you go to the instrument you have four standards you already took the reading for the four standards yang unknown tu what do you do with it find the concentration yes that's the whole purpose right you want to find the concentration but how how do you find the concentration what must you do to that solution get the get the response so just now we said we measured absorbance so get the absorbance you know put it into the instrument get the absorbance for the unknown so just now you plot a versus concentration 
you get a line using what? How must you draw your line? How must you get that straight line using graph paper? This is the third week of class, isn't it? Have you used your calculator yet? Not yet? How do you do your assignment then? Well, because the data was two points. Uh, if it's two points, no, no need to use it in regression. But if you had four, five points, linear regression on your calculator or using Excel to find the slope and the intercept. So once you get the plot, you have already measured the response for your unknown, what do you do? How do you use that plot? So you get absorbance versus concentration, your, un your standard. Now? Okay, we got the slope and intercept already. And I got the unknown unknown solution. I got the absorbance. What do I do then? How do I use the plot? So for this A, I get the unknown concentration. You've used your calculator already? Linear regression, not yet? Yes, yes or no? What is it? Um, uh, AX plus B, or is it the other way around? Yes. BX. What is it now, the latest? BX plus A. Okay, lah, BX plus A. So A is the intercept, B is the slope. And if you now have a Y for your unknown, you have a certain Y. In fact, you just Y and then you punch something, right? To get the X. You don't, even know, you don't even need to use this equation if you had it on your calculator. You already got, you already punch all the points. You just need to punch in the Y, the absorbance value for your unknown. You punch another, another key on your calculator and you will get the concentration which corresponds to that absorbance. Similarly, you can do the other way around also. If you know the X, you will know the... There's another set. If you, know an, if you know the value of the concentration, you can find the value of Y. All on your... Using the, the, the scientific calculator. I hope, if not by now, at least by this week, everybody, every one of you knows how to use that. Okay? So this is the calibration curve. Standard edition. So you know calibration curve, how do you identify that it's a calibration curve? You must have a series of standards. Okay? The worst thing to do will be to have only two standards maybe. Two standards for sure you have a straight line, okay? But of course you should have more, more than two. So you know it's a calibration curve using external standards when you prepare a series of standard solutions and you measure your unknown that's the met, uh, calibration curve now we go to the second one standard edition method you use this method when your sample is complex when you suspect there's a matrix effect matrix effect means there's something in your sample which will influence the reading that you get for your analyte okay so you want to overcome that matrix problem you use the standard edition method Standard edition method. Overall, what do you do? What solutions do you prepare? Known solution and unknown solution. How? What solutions do you prepare? What is your known and what's your unknown? Yes. Uh huh. Without analyte. Are you talking about the first technique?
from the name uh, standard edition method of standard edition just from the name you know that you must add something or the word is you know you spike your sample that's the the words to to the terms to relate with the second calibration technique you spike your sample or you have to add standard to your sample i will go to, again here i'm not quite i'm not too happy with that answer what solutions do you have to prepare if i want to use this method of standard edition again i come I come with you with an unknown what do I do what solutions do I prepare I think I've mentioned this already this must be the fourth or I don't know how, what time method of standard edition how many sam how many solutions minimum must I prepare three in gonna be First solution, what is it? Or oh, what is common to all the three solutions? Next, what is common to all? The? Yeah, of course, all must. Okay, I'm not too happy with that. Not, in, not, not, not the answer I'm looking for. What is the same in all three solutions? Analyte. Okay, we're talking about copper. Lah. Copper is the analyte. But, okay, well, for sure, analyte is there. You must have copper in all three. Next, what is it? What is the same? I'm going to ask the same question. Matrix is the same. How do we ensure that the matrix is the same? In all three solutions? Hmm? Before that, before the standard solution, what do you add? To all these three, what must you have in all three? Sample, yes. No sample was the point. And the light la at a standard la sample must be the same. The easiest way to do method standard edition is same volume of sample in all three solutions. Same volume. Okay? Sample is the same. Okay, one, what do you do to one then? Yeah. What do you do to solution one? You have added sample to all three flasks. Do I add anything to, to the first solution? Just dilute. Okay, dilute. With water or some buffer solution, whatever you need. What is special about solution two? Next. Just now, we say our analyte is copper. What must I... Must I add anything to two? What? What solution do I add to two? Copper. Some solution containing copper. Some standard solution containing copper. And let's say that's plus A ppm or PPB or whatever. You spike. Spike the solution with some standard copper solution. Do you do the same thing to solution 3? Yes. You add B. Where B is greater than A. So you spike solution 2. You spike solution 3. The spike here is greater than that. But you spike with your analyte. If you are interested in copper, you spike with copper. If it's sodium, you spike with sodium. Okay. So this is the method of standard addition. Same amount of sample to ensure that the matrix is the same because all contain sample compared to the first one that you have a series of standard solutions which are which doesn't contain the matrix and then you have your sample so the matrix of your sample is different compared to the matrix of your standard solutions if there's no matrix effect use the same one use A that's the easiest if there is a matrix effect you have to use this or perhaps the third one so the plot here will be where you're in your assignment do you notice that this is the one that your question which question was it the copper it has first they give you a solution 
containing copper they, they, they don't tell you how much they give you a reading right your sample solution and you're given I think it's emission emission for your copper sample and then they say they add some amount of copper right to that solution and you see that the number has now increased where well, y is greater than x you see that the reading has increased why why it has increased is because you have added some copper extra copper so here it's copper in the sample here you add some more copper so the reading has increased so you from here you already know that this must be a method of standard addition anytime you spike your sample with some analyte that's the key to say that it's using the method of standard addition you add the analyte you add the element that you are interested in the sample and this is the simplest kind of standard addition because it's a two-point curve one sample one sample plus a we said this one we have we have here three at least but this is even a simpler problem so you now it's a question of determining a what is a so that you can plot your emission versus concentration added a I'm almost dizzy of counting the votes last night for your representatives. So you, so you get that that problem is a method of standard addition. It is not the met, the first method because there's no standard solution prepared. So I say you must know how how come this is the third or fourth time I'm telling you about this and you st still doesn't stick to your mind because this one is a very important concept. When you do analysis, you have to understand this. In order to choose, you must understand each and every one of these calibration methods so that you can then decide for your particular problem which one must you use. The simplest is A, but when do you need to do, use B? When do you use C? Okay? Does everybody get this standard edition? And the last one. internal standard again you have to add something but you add an internal standard in method B when you say you spike you spike with the element that you are interested in in C you don't spike with the element that you are interested in you, you add an internal standard where the internal standard is behind whose turn is it next internal standard what is it compared to your analyte your, the classic example was what if your analyte is sodium because you I can ask you what what's a classic example of you know using internal standard this is one of them analyte is sodium what internal standard should I use lithium similar kind of metal so that if for this particular case we are measuring emission the signal we are measuring is emission why do we want to choose lithium some a similar kind of element is that any factor in the process which will influence emission of sodium will most likely influence emission of lithium for internal standard you choose something that will act in the same way as your analyte so if factor X or the, that day we use factor K if you, know, you have a factor K which influence the emission of sodium most likely that K factor will also influence the lithium and when you do internal standard you take the ratio you plot the ratio ratio of sodium intensity divided by your internal standard emission you always get the ratio you plot the ratio so for a particular concentration of standard 
you have your sodium you have your lithium you get your sodium signal and you get your lithium signal and you divide and you plot that is what you plot you plot your a ratio ratio versus concentration ratio of sodium to lithium so when you plot your ratio that k factor will be eliminated do you understand that that part if you have some unknown and you know, somebody was asking me that day what is this k there's there's no k assume that if there was some factor k that influenced that reading that same k will also influence here so you want to eliminate by taking the ratio you eliminate that external factor okay so this is the internal standard method so internal standard method you will even if it's not set in that problem you have to add something you add some ex internal standard okay so does everybody get it i keep telling you it's a small class the moment you don't understand something please repeat it i don't understand this sometimes maybe you're shy you know maybe oh am i the only one out of this 27 who doesn't understand it no there are probably 12 others who didn't understand it also but who never said anything so you be brave and say yes i don't understand it and you your other 12 friends will say oh alhamdulillah thank you very much for her you get one point extra in your right book for asking that question and helping your other 10 friends so okay i said i keep repeating it's a small class it's not 200 over class where you know you cannot ask questions but you only come to me when okay assignment time you know the way to prepare for this for a semester system is before class you read something after class you read it also so that's why you shouldn't be taking 20 any questions about this elevation everybody's quite clear and try to find problems so that you can uh, exercise you know exercise your understanding okay we now continue with our towards the end of what we were doing that day I hear um, what is it? Twelve o'clock. Bring some sweets. Quantitative aspects because these numbers you have to, you will be um, getting these numbers from the instrument. So you have to understand where they come from in order for you to be able to manipulate. So here we are talking about absorption methods. So you are going to measure the amount being absorbed. And we use this thing PO incident power given to your sample. Your sample is in a solution form. Some of it gets through, some of it is absorbed. P is the power of the transmitted radiation that has gone through your sample. Again, I asked what I asked the last the last time. If you have 100% absorption yeah blue to dome PO is being sent to the sample the sample absorbs 100% what comes through zero so as we see here P is zero PO is what you sent in it could be zero therefore transmittance will be next zero transmittance is zero when absorption is 100 percent as with any sciences terminology is very important eh? when you say a method is sensitive it's different when you say the method is accurate similarly here when you talk about transmittance is t the signal that you get from some absorption methods will be absorbance which is a that is the reading that you get from your uh, from the display or from the computer software okay the readings that you get absorbance the process is absorption the other one will be 
transmission so if we say just now 100% absorption T-I-O-N uh, absorption if it's 100% all being absorbed transmittance will be 0 or if we change it to percent T will be 0% T times 100 give you percent transmittance so percent transmittance if absorption is 100% transmittance is 0 0% if we go to the other extreme where you now have no absorption 0% absorption 0% absorption so it, what do you think it should be? 100% T everything is transmitted so those are the two extremes so absorption transmission is must come up to 100% if this is 100%, transmissions will transmission or percent transmittance will be zero. If absorption is zero, percent transmittance will be 100. And you have in between. Okay? So your samples will be in between. And this is now related to... I have to learn how to coordinate all this. We talk about transmission. Now, how is that relate? How is T transmittance related to absorbance? B A N C E. It's related through this um, logarithmic relationship. Okay, A is equal to log P O over P. And then you can do your manipulation. You know how you put in T. So A is equal to log one over T. Now, if you have percent T, how does that enter the equation? Is it given anywhere? It's for you to sort. It's a mathematical thing. I'm sure it's in the text. You know, I'm not here to teach you math. These are simple mathematics, so you should be able to, to do it. Because the, the, some of the exercises are, if you know T, you can convert to percent T. If you know percent T, how you can convert to A. Why do you need to do that is because although this is an old, you will not find this, this meter reading with this kind of this scale on your, on your instrument now. Everything is, uh, ha is interfaced to a computer. But if you were to go to an older instrument, you will find this scale where the scale on top is percent T. 0 to 100% T. So remember when we have 100% percent transmission absorbance is zero and if we, if we go back to the definition of absorbance just now which is to understand this uh, scale a is log p o over p t is p over p o so if you have 100% T, where 100% T means T is 0, 100% T means, sorry, 100% T is, P is not 0, P is 0. 100% T means T is what? What's the value for T? 1. Because P is PO, nothing is being absorbed. So if you put in PO, PO comes out. PO is transmitted. So T is 1 and percent T is 100%. And so this one will be PO over PO, log 1 will be 0. So absorbance is 0. On the other hand, if you have 0% T, 100% absorbance, there's no value of course. It's uh, infinity. Absorbance is infinity. So as we see the scale, the percent T scale is a linear scale. Linear because the divisions are of equal divisions, right? Between 0 to 10, 10 to 20 are all equal. But the log scale for absorbance is not linear. So for the lower absorbance readings, you have, you know, further apart. But as you go to high absorbance readings, it becomes closer, more difficult to read. But like I said, you will probably never see this. But you need to understand this to know the two extremes. And one important thing is, again, what is the purpose of getting the absorbance readings back there? The two guys in the black t-shirt. What's the purpose of this absorbance reading? Percent T. What, what, what do we want these readings for? 
Why do we want to take these readings? Why do you want to take the signal? Why do you want to measure the signal? What is the... Let's go back. Why do we want to measure the absorbance? What would be the reason for you to go to the instrument to measure the absorbance? To relate it to what? What do you want to relate the absorbance to? If you know the absorbance, so what? What's the purpose? To relate it to what? To? Not to know the T, not to calculate the T. You know, I mean, you have the problems there. You know the A, you can calculate the T. You know the T, you can calculate the A. That's not the purpose, right? You go and measure absorbance for what? What is the purpose when you go to that instrument? Anyone? Back there. Why? To, what, what do I want to get? Actually, what do I do know? Do I go to the instrument to measure the absorbance? No. What is my purpose when I do a certain analysis? If I do a quantitative analysis, what do I want to know? Fun. I'm looking for a single word. What is it? What do I want to relate absorbance to? What is the purpose of the calibration, Daddy? All those calibration techniques, what, what for? To find what relationship between what and what? Signal and concentration. So you measure absorbance, not to know the absorbance. Okay, after I know the absorbance, I tell my customer, oh, this sample, the absorbance is 0 0.05. So what? They got the 0.5. So what? It doesn't mean anything to them. That's why you have to do calibration techniques to relate the signal, the absorbance that you get, with concentration. So, the thing that is shown here is how absorbance, which is this, absorbance is log PO, PO over P or minus log P over PO. This is minus log T. It's related to some factor times concentration. And I think I missed that out in in my slides Beer's law for absorption absorb absorbance is proportional to concentration and we have said that you know only in the linear portion because there will become a certain beyond a certain concentration where a no longer is linear to C. So here, this is a slope. This is the K. So the absorbance which you measure, B, A, N, C, E, A, absorbance, is related to concentration, which is what you want to know. Because this is what you measure, this is what you are actually interested in. You don't want to know just the A for nothing. You want to know the A and you want to get the relationship between A and C. So for absorption techniques, absorption as in T-I-O-N, where you measure absorbance, you want to get this relationship, A versus C. Whether you use your calibration curve, whether you use method of standard addition, or whether you measure uh, use the internal standard method. All three things, this is what you're after. When you do quantitative analysis, you want to know the concentration. I do not want to just measure the absorbance for nothing. I want to know the concentration. So Beer's law, when you do absorption techniques, Beer's law is what you are uh, is what relates absorbance to concentration. And we will look at emission. It's just emission again. You want to relate that to concentration. So. Beer's law is only for absorption. Oh, no, I wanted to show that instrument. We will look into this instrument schematic, this schematic for this instrument again, but here, the purpose of showing you this here is just to understand how do we calibrate our meter that will read the percent T. So the purpose of this whole instrument is to measure A, absorbance. But 
to make you understand it better instead of showing absorbance we show percent t but you will already know how to calculate right from percent t you know how to calculate a so how do we set up this meter so that when i put in my sample i can get a reading for my sample which is correct just like your ph meter you use your buffer 4 your buffer 7 you calibrate your ph meter with two buffers you put in a pH 4, put your pH electrode into the buffer solution 4, you make sure it reads 4. Then you put it into 7, a buffer of pH 7, and you make sure it reads 7. Then only you put in your sample solution and you read off the meter. Without changing any settings, read off what the pH is. Similarly here now is you want to use this instrument to measure your percent T of your unknown solution. How do you now calibrate that instrument? So you calibrate by calibrating the 0% T or the 100% T. Remember 100% T is, here we have a source, the tungsten lamp. Your sample is here and here is your meter. Okay? But you must have some detector which changes light to current because the current will, will make this meter show some reading. Okay? So that things that we will look into um, in the next chapter but now it's just understanding this percent T readings so okay we now want to calibrate it let's say 0% T 0% T means 0% T does any light get through? here yes 0% transmittance is there any light getting through? here is your source sending P0 here is your thing that gets through Nothing gets through, okay? How do I make sure that 0% T, I have a shutter? A shutter which blocks the light. It blocks the light from coming from the lamp. Nothing goes through the sample. And you set 0% T. So by using the shutter, you set 0% T. But in the actual instrument, you don't press anything to... to, to get the shutter down you know just by closing the surf, uh, the sample container it's already set so that you have the shutter down so set 0% T you, ha you have a shutter which blocks the light altogether now next we want to set the 100% T you set 100% T you want total transmission right no absorption so you cannot have your sample here what you will have is your container containing solvent no analyte because analyte will absorb okay so you have a solution of your blank of your solvent of your buffer whatever in the sample in the path of the radiation and you set there's another uh, there's another dial that you set so that the reading is then 100% T so you have set both you have set the 0% T then you put in your solvent your container containing solvent you set 100% T take out that container now you put the same kind of container which contains your sample into the um, measuring compartment and you get a reading for your percent T so for absorption uh, measurements this is what you have to do you know, set the 0% T, set the 100% T. Of course, how it's done, like I said, this is the most manual kind of instrument. Now, when you have more higher, um, more sophisticated version, more sophisticated versions of the instrument, perhaps you only set the, you know, the 0% uh, or something. You don't, you don't really set both. But this is the best way so that you know how you get the absorption readings. Any question about this? Just take it like, okay, this is like a pH meter. Any questions? Um, another thing that I think I missed out. B. If your solution, if your sample is a solution and you want to measure the absorbance, usually we put it into a container called a cuvette. 
you know, this is from a lack of lab absorption. So I'm not going to do it. Dr. Lim will be doing it. But the fact is, if it's a solution, you want to measure the absorbance, you put it into a cuvette with a certain length. So the length is B. So that's where the in the Beer's law, absorbance is equal to epsilon B C. C is concentration. B is the length of that, the path length. We call it the path length. The length of the sample container which the radiation goes through. So we see here that if B is bigger, absorbance is bigger. C is bigger, absorbance is bigger too. Epsilon is a characteristic of the thing that absorbs, the compound that absorbs, whatever that absorbs. So you know, so different things will have different epsilon values. Absorbance. Uh, the units for all these things, for all epsilon BC is if B is in centimeters, C is in molar, mole per liter, then epsilon will be called the molar absorption coefficient or extinction, uh, extinction coefficient or something, epsilon. So if you know the units for B and you, you know the units for C, you know the units of epsilon because it's uh, the inverse because A has no units so the units of epsilon must cancel out the units of B and C okay so usually when you write it as epsilon it must be C in molar mole per liter B in centimeters you have an older version of the Beer's law A if you use A that means B can be some other units and C can be some other units you know A but again, the same thing, A ke epsilon ke, it's a characteristic of the absorbing species. Different absorbing species will have different values of epsilon. Um, so if we, we talk about uh, atomic absorption, when you take absorbance readings, it's for quantitative means that we want to find what the concentration is. Qualitative means we just find out what is the wavelength at which absorption occurs. You don't know the concentration. Qualitative means we just know that what is the wavelength and we identify from that wavelength what the element is. Copper absorbs at 324 nanometers, for example. Sodium at 589 nanometers. Zinc absorbs at 213 nanometers so different elements have different characteristic absorption wavelengths that's how we identify these elements if not how do you know you go to a instrument with a mixture of elements how are we going to know what absorbance reading to take so that you know the concentration of copper similarly if you want to know the concentration of zinc what readings should you take you know it's not a one machine any reading will tell you whatever element you know there's a how you set up the, the instrument so that you can measure the different elements. So like in all of the techniques that we're going to be discussing, it's either qualitative or quantitative. If it's quantitative, you must use one of the calibration techniques. If it's qualitative, it's just for emission and absorption, it's just identifying what the uh, emission wavelength is or what the uh, absorption wavelength is to, to identify what the element is. And mass, we'll talk about that differently. Okay. Five minutes. So that was the intro on spectrometric methods. Interaction of electromagnetic radiation with matter. The next thing that we're going to look at is components of this instrument. So you're going to look at very technical things. Before we look at the proper technique, before we look at atomic absorption spectroscopy, before we look at atomic emission spectroscopy, the techniques which you use to do the analysis. Oh yes. Uh, I think it's assignment 3, not 4 Which is due 10th of October Not next week, the week after next I think we'll get, get done with uh, Whatever we have to do 
Okay, this is now to show what is the general design of this equipment, uh, instruments that we use. Optical refers to usually absorption or emission in the visible. You know, or we go a bit into the UV. So we are going to be looking at three different kinds of instruments. For atomic absorb, uh, for the atomic part, we will just be looking at atomic absorption and atomic emission. For the molecular part, you will be looking at all three. Okay, but so now what we want to look at is the general design of the. Uh, what are the main components in such an instrument? When you talk about absorption, an instrument used to measure absorption, what are the main components? If you talk about instrument to measure emission, what are the main components? Fluorescence, what are the main components? So you have to know. I'm not expecting you, what you should know how to draw is block diagrams. We are going to look at maybe some detailed schematic diagrams. Those are not meant for you to memorize. Those are meant for you to look at and understand. Oh, these are the components in the equipment. But what you must be able to do is block diagrams. You know what block diagrams mean? Just a square saying source, square saying monochromator, square saying detector, and show the the arrangement of the different components in the instrument. So when we talk about absorption, remember we want to measure how much the sample absorbs. So we, are, we need to have a source because you're sending PO. PO must come from somewhere, it cannot come from the sky. Okay? Your incident radiation must come from some source, from some lamp. So you have a source, you have your sample, you have your detector. Remember, the detector is to convert all these arrows refer to the black arrows refer to radiation, electromagnetic radiation. The blue one is signal, whether it be voltage, current, or whatever, to run your uh, sig how you, to further process your signal and get a readout. Whether your readout is on a meter, digital display, or interface to a computer. So for absorption, these are the main components. The source, somewhere to put the sample, the detector, and the signal processor. And we will look at another important component, which is the wavelength selector. Let's say I want to measure absorption for copper. You have, sam you have copper in your sample. I want to make sure that the wavelength that I send to my sample is a copper, is a... Uh, wavelength that will be absorbed by copper. I don't want to send a, a light which will be absorbed by sodium and not by copper. So I want to make sure that the light that I send to the sample is of a wavelength which is characteristic of the element that I want to measure. Okay, so we need a wavelength selector to make sure that the wavelength that we send to the sample is the wavelength of the end light that we are interested in. That's why you need a wavelength selector. And the simplest wavelength selector is a filter. You know coloured paper? Have you seen coloured plastic paper? Yellow, red, whatever. If you use a red coloured color paper and you put it in front of you, what do you see? Everything will be red. If you put a yellow one, it will be yellow. Why is that so? That will finish our class today. Why? I put a red Everything is red. Something to do with light. Excuse me. What happens huh, to that? What happens as you... For you to see light, it must go to your eye, right? So the light from outside will go through that red coloured paper, coloured plastic paper and get to your eye. So, light is many, many wavelengths, right? V, I, B, G, Y, O, R, whatever. Right? All the colours of the rainbow, white light. But as it goes through that, as it goes through the, okay, white light, red colour paper, makes me see, oh, only red. What happens between the light and when it goes to your eye? What happens? What happens? How does the filter paper, what happens between the light and the filter, that filter, sorry, that red coloured plastic paper, uh, plastic sheet? For you to see red, it must absorb the 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 other the complementary colors. You know about complementary colors? 
if it's red means it absorbs in another region if it's yellow it absorbs in another region it doesn't mean if it's red it absorbs red no right so the reason why you see red is it absorbs the other region v-i-b-g-y-o-r that means the violet the violet indigo region the green so it transmits the the red that's why you see red so similarly that that idea of a filter same idea as those yellow green whatever plastic sheets that you use to you know to select the different colors because these different colors are different wavelengths so the same idea why we need that filter why what is the function of that filter okay so i guess that'll be it